But one of the things you see over and over again in these soldiers' letters is when they, if, if they give an example of destruction, if they give an example of war's destructive hand on society, they inevitably talk about the farms are not being kept up. There's nothing, these, there's nothing growing in these fields this year. The fields have been let go. The fences are down. Things are falling apart. Nature is taking over and not being improved upon. And the soldiers in the field seem to see that as destruction. And, and I think Lincoln is, the, the way I see you writing about Lincoln, he's kind of reflecting that point of view, that the natural thing to do is to improve nature, not to leave nature to grow it over. Yeah, and in some ways that, that represents their um, struggle with the whole concept of wilderness. Mm -hmm. um, that um, wilderness is uh, raw nature, and then it's to be improved upon to support a society and a republican government and, mm -hmm. and way of life. Um, and the war, the destructiveness of the war, um, counters that. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems to be turning society back into what was there before. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's one of those golden moments or topics that sometimes we uh, stumble over as historians when we realize Today, I think we would almost universally believe that continuing to cut down trees and improve our environment is causing us enormous harm, mm -hmm. uh, and it is an unnatural phenomenon. And back then, it, almost everyone would have agreed that that's the natural thing to do. Humans do this with nature. We manipulate it. Yeah. Sure, and I, and I, but I would say that there is a root back in this period with Lincoln of um, the way we think today. Um, and Lincoln, this is a part of him that uh, not very many people know, just as they don't know his speech on discoveries and inventions, he signed in, uh, the Yosemite Park Act of 1864. Um, and that was a measure that uh, was an attempt to shield um, Yosemite Valley, that magnificent collection of um, geological wonders from commercial development first time that was taken was uh, was then. Um, so I think you can see a little bit of it there. Mm -hmm. um, what I think is very interesting, I would say that um, the Emancipation Proclamation itself was the first attempt to shield a part of nature from the excesses of the commercial market. Oh. Um, it's just that it was human nature. Mm -hmm. I think the same impetus that led Lincoln to issue that um, also led him to um, sign the Yosemite Park Act. Mm -hmm. Um, same thing, shielding part of the, the physical world, some substance in it from the excesses of commercialism. Mm -hmm. And if personal improvement is natural, then it follows that nothing is more unnatural than slavery. He would say it was very unnatural. Of course, there are going to be people in the South who would disagree with him mightily, but um, that's what, the way he would say That would it. be the way Lincoln would frame mm -hmm. That's the way he would frame, frame it. it. If you have any questions at home, please send them in. We want to answer them. We're also going to periodically, once or twice, open up uh, questions to the folks who have come and joined us here uh, in the bookshop. And I think we have at least one person that would like to say a question. And Mark, if you could repeat it so that the folks at home sure. can know what in we're... In regard to the issue of personal improvement, I think Lincoln's speech that you're referring to about national improvements is a milestone in Lincoln's personal development Michael, Michael Burlingame's Inner World of Abraham Lincoln describes the period from about 49 to 54 as Lincoln's reach, remaking of his identity and growth into the person of the, of the presidential Lincoln, of the, the political Lincoln of the 50s and 60s. Mm -hmm. And I think that it's a, an improvement speech that is a personal milestone for Lincoln in that regard that Burlingame uh, alludes to. Mm -hmm. Right, and I, I, that's that's the period when he writes the the speech on discoveries and inventions. Mm -hmm. And yeah. um, one of the arguments about that speech is that it's not it's not as great as the Getty, uh, Gettysburg Address. It's it's not as great as it, as his uh, inaugural addresses and so forth. Um, and that it was a, a rather dull, mundane speech, um, mm -hmm. rightly forgotten. Um, mm -hmm. But I think if you look at the speech carefully, it it does connect. His, his view of humankind's place in nature um, with his politics. Um, it's a very interesting thing. 
I want to show something here, and we're going to segue into a topic about war, although it's not actually going to be <laughs> about war. Here is a commission. Uh, this is a military commission, uh, in this case for a uh, regular army officer, Electus Bacchus. Uh, it, it appoints him a colonel of the 6th Infantry. Uh, the story of Electus Bacchus is he was a career army officer near the beginning of the war. Lincoln gave him this commission. He was supposed to organize the troops in Detroit. He was an a older fellow at the time. He went to Detroit to report for duty, quickly fell ill, and, and, and died. Gave his life for his country, organizing the troops at Detroit. So we don't know Electus Bacchus as well as we know George McClellan or George Henry Thomas. But for the purposes of Mark's book, let's look at this document, at this artifact. Um, it, Lincoln personally signed every commission. That meant that he used a pen and an inkwell. inkwell. That meant he used iron gall ink to make his signature down here. Depending on how he mixed the ink that day, the signature could be bolder or lighter. Uh, depending on how he mixed it that day, the signature can fade almost out in 150 years or it can remain like it did on this document. The document is on vellum. Vellum is skin. Uh, there was a process, there's a system that brought this document into being. And by the time it reached Electus Bacchus or any other officer in the regular Army, Navy, or Marine Corps of the United States, he would take it, he would fold it up, he would put it in his coat pocket, and he would take it to the field. If anybody wants to buy or collect a Lincoln signature and they want to get a military commission, you get this extra aspect to it. It's not just Lincoln's signature. It's an artifact of a battle. It's been, to, it's been to the war. It's been to the battle, and it was carried in the battle by this guy. That is his commission to lead men in battle. Mark, can you give us a comment on maybe deconstruct a commission as a natural thing? Sure. Um, I think we often think of uh, reading and writing and ideas as immaterial. Um, these are abstractions. Um, but I think this illustrates really nicely that, in fact, w whatever immateriality to ideas, they are carried on physical things. Um, I think that's a, the case with Lincoln. Lincoln is often defined as a man, uh, as a man defined by ideas and the books that he read in many respects rightly so, but um, those books were physical material things that were made out of substances drawn from the American landscape. Mm -hmm. um, reading itself for him was a physical act. Um, he read out loud. While he was learning to read, he liked to read out loud because he felt hearing the words um, reinforced um, themselves on his memory. Mm -hmm. um, Lincoln often um, took a break from doing that hard physical labor um, in order to read. Um, so I think in, the, in these senses you can see that reading for Lincoln was not an abstraction. This was uh, directly related to who he was as a physical being and uh, related to the work, the other kinds of work, the labor that he was performing in the land. I think oftentimes we draw this, I would say it's a false boundary between ideas and, and our physical experience of things, of, of nature and work and so forth. Um, and I think in Lincoln's uh, own life you can see how these things are directly connected. Mm -hmm. The military commission brings us into the Civil War, the battles. Your chapter that touches on the Civil War talks about the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, and I loved that chapter. We're not going to even have enough time. <laughs> I could spend the entire hour on your ideas about the effect of the Battle of Gettysburg on nature and nature's effect on the Battle of Gettysburg. Can you summarize that? And then maybe we'll talk in, uh, about another couple more Gettysburg topics. Yeah, sure. Um, when, I, when I researched this chapter, um, I, I found it very interesting that um, in many ways the, the reasons for the battle, um, if not the war itself, had a lot to do with the condition of landscape, um, the need of armies for resources drawn from landscape. Um, a lot of this had to do with um, diseases and shortages that uh, the, the Army of Northern Virginia was experiencing. Um, and a lot of this prompted Lee to take the Army north um, into Pennsylvania. And um, when uh, Kent Brown's book, for example, yes. which um, discusses um, the astonishing number of um, head of livestock 
um, that the Army of Northern Virginia extracted from Pennsylvania and sent down south. I think that just is a real graphic example um, of how this was um, not just a story of two armies maneuvering against each other, trying one trying to defeat the other, but it had a lot to do with um, armies as organic entities, the need for food, the need for energy, the need for uh, horsepower, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we were talking before about uh, military historians seem to understand, but maybe sometimes they struggle with finding the right language to get people to understand that uh, an army is an organism that whose purpose is to take in energy, translate it into something else, and then project it as military energy. Um, and I think they do that in order to try to get people to understand the concepts of logistics and supply and so on and so forth. But I think we also need to understand it as you point out uh, very well, from a natural and environmental point of view. The Battle of Gettysburg is a horrific translation of natural energy into armies, thus into military power, and then again, sadly, into organic matter, which continues to affect humans. Well, I think there's any number of ways you can you can consider this. For me, one of the really interesting things is if you look at Lee and the Army of Northern Virginia, Lee is very good at um, maneuvering his army. Mm -hmm. um, he's very good at um, uh, kind of going against uh, military doctrine and splitting his forces mm -hmm. and maneuvering them. But of course, to maneuver like that, to have your army mobile, um, you need to have food and fodder. You need to have um, energy, basically, for that military force. Um, and I think that's a, it's, it's a fascinating aspect of, of the story. Um, the fact that um, uh, by 1862, 1863, the, uh, his horse herds are diminishing. Um, by the spring of 1863, they're running out of food. Um, they're even suffering the, uh, from malnourishment. Um, it's these kind of things that begin to orient his mind toward the possibilities of the North. Um, another dimension of this, for example, is the classic story of how the battle begins. You've got a battalion of North Carolina so soldiers going down the road toward Gettysburg. What are they looking for? They're looking for shoes. Mm -hmm. um, so there, the, the fact that they, they were short of um, leather. Mm -hmm. um, and that has a whole interesting backstory to it yeah. about um, deprivation and destruction in the environment. Well, partly short of leather because it's short of livestock. Yeah. And then that creates leather.